Hey, I'm Beth Riley for our Artist Spotlight podcast series. On this episode, I had a chance to talk with Devin Berryhill, who leads his own band, The Termaliners, and he also plays in The Safaris with his dad and original co-founder of the band, Bob Berryhill. We talk about the brand new album from The Termaliners called Surfidia playing with his family in the safaris, and so much more. Let's get into my chat with Devin Berryhill. What is it like playing music with your family, more specifically your dad and the safaris? It's great. My dad taught me how to play guitar at a very young age. Uh, bought me my first guitar when I was about eight years old. And a uh, playable guitar. Before that, I think I had the little toy guitars uh, <laughs> as a kid. But, uh, you know, I always admired my dad. I really didn't know who he was or what he was when I was little. After surf music kind of hit its hiatus in the 60s, my dad went back to school and got his college degree. So I kind of knew him as a young child. It's just kind of this guy who went to school and ended up getting a degree in teaching and taught college eventually, actually. So I was about six years old. There was a kind of a reunion show with Dick Dale and the Deltones, Adventures, Jan and Dean. The Chante, some of those early bands played at this place called the Hollywood Palladium in California, of course. And that was the first time I ever saw him be a rock star. I was like, wow, this is cool. He's the coolest dad on the block, you know. My, all my friends on the block who were, their dads were firemen and policemen or something cool kids like to talk about. And I was like, my dad's a rock star. You guys didn't know that. So anyway, that was about six years old. And then um, I just kind of grew up around it. He gave me one guitar lesson when I was a kid. He showed me how to play Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry. Well, oh, there <laughs> you was, go. <laughs> that was the first thing I ever learned how to play. Just kind of the rhythm picking there. And then he showed me how to shuffle it. And that was pretty much the only lesson I ever had in my life, actually. But after that, I got to just be with him. I got to see the original five guys in the safaris play live as a child. So that was a big impression on me. Of course, I got to see Dick Dale and all his adventures and the original lineups of all these original groups. So that was my lessons, really. I got to see all that in person and ask questions. And I'd go up to the other band members and go, hey, how'd you do that on guitar in between breaks and stuff? And they would show me little riffs. So I was fortunate enough to kind of be taught by the founders, if you will, of surf music how to play surf music. And later on in life, I started coming up and forming my own little surf bands in junior high. I had a little band called The Last Wave. <laughs> and we played my eighth grade graduation, that kind of thing. So my parents would encourage me in that. And then in high school, I had my own surf band again, another band. And then um, kind of went out, did my own thing and, and alternative music, kind of like Red Hot Chili Peppers and U2 and The Clash and The Ramones and B-52s and all that kind of stuff were big when I was in high school. So I put it together band kind of in, in that genre. But as I got older, my dad would have me sit in with him once in a while and play. And then as some of the other members of the safaris had either passed away or, or couldn't play or didn't want to play anymore, uh, my dad started filling in with myself and my brother and my mom, too. She plays bass for me. She was a concert violinist, so she uh, had a musical background, too. So that just kind of came together. Gee, about year 2000, we started doing that, 2000, 2001. And it's just been a lot of fun. It's a family vacation. You know, my brother and I have kids ourselves, so it's kind of like when the band goes out and plays like Hawaii or something or the East Coast, we'll bring the grandkids, so to speak, and have make it a family vacation. So it's a lot of fun. We enjoy each other as family and we're a close family. We've always played music together, but uh, as a safari, it's something we've done probably for the last 22 years now. And your daughter, Grace, and she's a singer as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, she just graduated from high school, actually Mission Bay High School here in San Diego last semester in June. And so it's kind of the family business, what we do. My, my other daughter, Jane, plays bass and guitar and taught her how to play. And she plays in some bands at school. She just graduated from college, actually, herself. But Grace is a great singer, and she has an acoustic guitar and writes her own songs and that kind of thing, yeah. What is your favorite song by the Beach Boys? We have to ask everybody. <laughs> uh, Warmth of the Sun. Say, I love that song. That's such a beautiful tune. I love the chord progression and the harmonies, of course, and the way the melody. Brian Wilson, of course, was a genius, but Warmth of the Sun is definitely the best song. On the tour millionaire side of things, how did signing with Pacific Records come about? Well, we did a one album licensing deal with Altered State of Reverb with Josh Graham. He's a great guy. And when 
supporting that Christmas album through COVID. And through the process, Josh is uh, going through some transitions, moving his family from New York to back to where he's from, Pennsylvania, and just kind of needed some time a year to kind of regroup and, and he's, he's still working his label, but he just kind of told me, I need, I need some time. If you guys need to move forward with another label, we don't want to hold you back kind of thing. So I pitched the album to a few different labels, um, some friends in the surf music world. And then also outside of surf music, more of a general market, just to kind of see what was out there. And a mutual friend of mine, a guy named Bart Mendoza, he's a legend here in San Diego. He's a guitarist, songwriter. He's had a number of bands here in town, San Diego, but uh, he's also in the media. He writes for the San Diego Union Tribune and the Troubadour and a bunch of different local magazines and online things. And so he had me on a show, a talk show that he was hosting a video talk show myself and my second guitarist joe we came on kind of did a little acoustic set well one of the guests on the show was uh, brian wick and he's the president of an owner founder of pacific record so anyway we kind of met through that bart introduced us and and bart actually has a new single out on pacific records as well and so it's just kind of this conversation that started about a year ago and as we started talking i share with him kind of our vision for the new album before we even started recording. And he said, well, guy, you know, sounds like something that would fit well in Pacific Records because Pacific Records isn't necessarily a surf music or even retro label, but they are very into beach culture. A lot of their groups and artists are kind of in the reggae, kind of Southern Cal beach, um, almost kind of like bands that sound like, you know, Bob Marley or, or groups like 311, they have some groups that are more acoustic, kind of like a Jack Johnson vibe, that kind of thing. And even the owner, Brian, he has a, he has a Hawaiian slack key group called Slack Key Ohana. And, uh, they're getting pretty popular here in town. So he thought our music would kind of just fill out kind of that beach culture staple of artists. It's funny you mentioned Jack Johnson. I literally just finished a show focusing on Jack Johnson. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's. He's cool. I actually, I got a funny story if you want to hear on Jack. Johnson. Yeah, sure. I actually almost ran over him in well, Hawaii. <laughs> he, he just doesn't have good luck. <laughs> well, yeah, the safaris, we were on tour in Hawaii about five years ago, maybe even more now. And that was like 10 years ago. We had friends of friends with Jack Johnson's parents. This is before his dad had passed away. And they own a place right on Pipeline, right there at the, on the north shore of Oahu. And our friends, the Irons family, Rick Irons, their cousins to Andy Irons, the pro surfer, they knew the, the Johnson family. In fact, they go back 40, 50 years. And so they said, hey, well, they have a house they rent right on the beach there. So we flew over and my mom and I came over a little bit early on a flight to kind of get things set up because we were going to bring over the grandkids and do all this stuff. And so we got a little rental car and we're driving into Haleiwa, which is the town right there, the main town in the North Shore. We were going to go to the Haleiwa Cafe, which is kind of like the local hangout where you, you know, kind of the greasy spoon there in town. And I'm pulling up around the sharp turn and I, I kind of gunned it a little hard. And all of a sudden this guy ends up on my hood of my car. <laughs> with his face in the windshield, and it's Jack Johnson. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, I'm like, I almost killed Jack Johnson. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't do this. It's too bad. Anyway, he had a big laugh on his face because he was joking around. He'd actually jump purposely on my car. Oh, jeez. Uh, and and from, he didn't know who we were. He was just being a clown. So anyway, the world can thank me for not totally killing Jack Johnson. Yes. So that's my story. <laughs> I'm sticking with it. <laughs> We heard a new song off of your upcoming album called Grimace. Not the album. Uh -huh. Not the album, the song. <laughs> but what can we expect to hear on the new album? That's cool. I'm glad you got that. The new single, Grimace, that's the first cut on the album. It's kind of punk rock, kind of early 80s influence a little bit. It's got a nice surf guitar kind of melody to it. But the rest of the album is very uh, diverse in terms of styles. We've got everything from your traditional surf type song. You know, the whole album's instrumental. The surf guitar is the center of the album. It plays the melody on all the songs. The classic reverb, Fender, Jazzmaster, Stratocaster kind of sound plays center stage. But the rhythm section behind it changes. So some of the songs 
you know, will be traditional kind of, you know, up-tempo kind of surf stuff. Some of it's real slow. Like the title track of the album is called Surfidia. And I kind of wrote it in the style of the song uh, Santo and Johnny's Sleepwalk, kind of a slow dance type song. When, when we play live, a lot of people like to dance at our shows. And so they like a romantic tune that could dance with their partner, so to speak. So we wrote something to kind of fit in that sleepwalk genre. And then some songs sound real ventures, kind of like very fun, very melodic, almost kind of in the walk, don't run, perfidia kind of sound. In fact, notice the name Surfidia. Yeah. <laughs> very similar uh, in that way. And then we have some songs on there that are kind of like almost kind of cowboy, spaghetti western, something you'd hear on more soundtrack. And then some songs, we've got a song that's kind of like Tequila by the Champs, you know, real fun, danceable, up tempo. It's got an acoustic guitar as, as the rhythm guitar as opposed to like an electric. We even have one song that's reggae, which we had on our first album, uh, Termaline Dream. We had one song called Green Pipe that was a reggae. And this is like a blend of surf music and reggae, which again kind of ties in with the Pacific Records thing. I think that's one of the reasons why they like this in that way. But um, yeah, I mean, all kinds of fun, super fast, mid-tempo, slow, soundtrack, uh, traditional surf. That's how I describe it. The tour millionaires are mm -hmm. you and Joe mm -hmm. and John, Matt, and mm -hmm. Ina. Yeah. On second guitar is Joe Dameron, and on bass is Matt Klaumanzer, and on drums is John McElwee, and then Ina Solis okay. on keyboards okay, and vocals. Cool. Okay, cool. So as a band, who are some of your influences as a band? I wish I had the band here to answer that. I guess I could say collectively, like Joe and I, we're the principal guitar players uh, in the band. I think we both are kind of influenced from Dick Dale to Ventures to The Lively Ones. I know Joe's favorite group is The Lively Ones. Um, the Astronauts, you know, some of these songs like Baja, they're really cool. But for me, you know, Dick Dale is probably my number one. But in terms of melody and songwriting, I would say probably The Ventures. Even though they didn't write a lot of their songs, their songs tended to be a lot more melodic overall. Yeah. And they didn't have as much reverb on the guitar as a more drier sound, generally speaking. So they were able to play a little bit more succinctly, whereas where Dick Dale, he, he tends to be a lot more reverb and double pick style. And he tended to work a lot with Middle Eastern scales. You know, he was Lebanese background. So he had a lot of that kind of Middle East kind of sound. So when you hear a song like Misery Lou, you hear that, da 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 you know, all that kind of middle those those modes they call modes or modal type songs and so the double pick kind of works like that so i, I like the power of, of dick dale he's like the godfather of heavy metal or something i guess but <laughs> I, I just love the power and the passion that he put into it but, but i love the ventures kind of melodic and rhythmic sensitivity we here in the riley household are huge fans of weezer but we're also huge fans mm -hmm. of the tourmaliners cover of Island in the Sun. Um, yeah. Do you have a personal favorite song to cover? Well, that's a good one. Island in the Sun. We also did uh, 311's Amber, a version of that. I'm a big Weezer fan. I mean, I like songs from almost any genre of rock and roll from the 50s to what's coming out today. But in the 90s, definitely out of all the kind of early 90s, I don't want to call them grunge bands, but that kind of period of Nirvana and Soundgarden and all that, you know, for me, I love Rivers Cuomo's vocal ability and its melodic structure. I mean, he could just write the greatest songs. He still can. It's just so catchy, so hooky, and, you know, you're just singing them all day. So when it came to writing a cover, when I heard Island in the Sun, I was like, wow, this is a great song. It would be great to somehow surf it up, kind of like what they did with Buddy Holly a little bit. Where they had kind of that little surfy kind of beat to it. I put the Buddy Holly beat that they did, instead of going with a heavy distortion on the chorus of Island the Sun, I took the Buddy Holly beat and put it that kind of vibe into the chorus on Island of the Sun. So it's really kind of a tribute to both of those songs. The Buddy Holly one is my favorite Weezer song, oh, yeah. so yeah, it's my favorite. That's a good one. Yeah, fun. Who is an artist that you would like to work with that you haven't had the chance to work with yet? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> oh, do you have all day? Yes. Uh, <laughs> In a fantasy land, I'd love to work with Edge from U2, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> that probably won't happen. But uh, I always thought he was a great surf guitarist, though, to be 
honest with you. I always thought his playing was with the echo and all that. I mean, the Safaris were doing stuff. If you listen to a song called Dune Buggy by the Safaris, and I think it's on Fun City. He's got that delay guitar going. He's playing to the tap tempo delay echo effect on his guitar before Pink Floyd and U2 and different groups that were, were doing that. So, yeah, that would be kind of my fantasy draft on that one. <laughs> Okay. Not a bad but, one. <laughs> uh, but in reality, you know, I, I kind of on a, I don't know, I love Brian Setzer. <laughs> That's kind of a fantasy too, I guess. That's my birthday, buddy. We share uh, April 10th birthday. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a few uh, years older. But man, it'd be great to do something with him. I've got to play with his bass player, Lee Rocker. Yeah. yeah we play with him. So far as we played with him last, last summer, actually, in Michigan. Okay. That was cool. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So those are probably my, some of my top players I'd love to play with. If you could pick three to five albums to take with you to a desert island, which ones would you pick? Three to five albums. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's see here. Probably Boy by U2. I would probably pick Steve Ray Vaughan, Texas Flood, probably The Clash, London Calling, Dick Dale, Surfer's Choice. You know, adventures, probably just the Walk Don't Run album. Those are probably my top ones there. Where is the craziest place that you have ever heard wipe out? Where was I recently? And I heard it just on the Muzak. <laughs> In the mall, I think. <laughs> you know, you hear, you know, or on TV, you know, you'll see a commercial or a movie. It'll come on. I don't know if they're crazy or not. I did hear a story about a guy who used to listen to Wipeout. He's from Pakistan and he would play it while he worked that was kind of crazy and then i even heard about marine pilots in vietnam used to play it oh, geez. Their, like little headsets while they go on their bombing runs <laughs> I mean, that's crazy <laughs> yeah violent. i guess that was like kind of an encouraging song yeah but wipe out does not mean wipe out the entire country <laughs> <laughs> no, bombers <laughs> you said crazy that's pretty crazy yeah <laughs> Who inspires you? Probably most consistently my whole life been uh, Bono from U2. You know, he's so over-publicized, but, you know, I've been a fan since 81, and I've seen him like 11 or 12 times live. I think what is amazing about him, I think we were similar in personality type, but I love how he uses his passion in music and art and creativity, and he connects it with helping humanity and helping people in foreign countries with all that he's done with poverty and helping raise support. I remember seeing the Amnesty Tour in the 80s and Live Aid and all that. You'd never really seen that in rock and roll in a real way. I mean, George Harrison had done something with, like the concert for Bangladesh. And I think Dylan had done a bunch of stuff. But I think Bono and you 2 kind of put that together in a way that made it almost cool to be philanthropic, if you will, and, and helping cure diseases and help Africa get the American government and other governments around the world to cancel their debt that was just crushing them this country. I don't know. There's a little part of that in me when I play. It's like I'm, I'm thinking about humanity. I'm thinking about what we're doing, what we're trying to help people, you know, with our music. And as artists, I think we I think we have a responsibility. I, I'm not a political person. I don't, I don't really like politics. I don't like talking about politics at all. Thank you for not asking me. <laughs> what party I belong to or anything. I, I do I do vote and I do support that, but at the same time I'm more concerned about human beings and their needs and I think Bono's connection with his faith is also really cool for me. I think that I have faith in God as well. And so to me it's spiritual. It's all spiritual. Music spiritual. Helping your fellow man is all together for me. And so Bono and the band you 2 has been more effective than really any artists in the world of all time, really, on multiple levels. So I would say Bono. And this one's kind of a goofy question. So you can laugh, but don't get mad because I'm. It, it's really just a joke question. Sure. All right, the Tourmaliners or the Safaris? <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> For what? <laughs> which, you know, which one's the better band? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I can't answer that one. But, uh, it's like it's like what what you, you know if you're a workman and you go to your toolbox, what tool do you need for the job? You know you can't sit there and go, oh, the hammer is much better than the screwdriver because the hammer would work horribly on a screw that needs to be screwed in. You know, they right. both have their purposes. I don't see them at all in any kind of direct competition. All I see, I mean, my dad's a classic. There's no competition. 
Yeah. He's a real wipeout. You know, he performed one of the greatest surf bands ever and had probably one the biggest hit in the genre, maybe of all the bands. But he's an amazing player. When you hear him play, I've had the privilege of standing next to him my entire life, hearing him come back in my monitors or when I'm playing, and he taught me how to play. So you'll hear his style in my playing because it's just, you know, osmosis, you know, just kind of rubs off on you. But for the term leaders, for me, that's a, it's a different kind of outlet. It's just, uh, I'm able to kind of lead the show there, if you will, yeah. and write the songs. And we've gone in a little slightly different direction than the safaris. You know, we're not as much traditional in the surf genre, if you will, but, um, there's nothing like getting up and playing Wipeout or Scatter Shield or some of the, you know, Safari songs, Burning Rubber, Surf Scene. I love playing those Surfer Joe. I love, I mean, at the end of the show, we usually close with Wipeout. I mean, come on. It's one of the most iconic songs of all time and I get to play it yeah. with the guy who wrote it. You know, I mean, the crowd response and the, you know, I'm a performer. So of course I love, to me, bigger is better in terms of the people that are out there and the, the amount of people I've been uh, been privileged enough to play to with my father is staggering. I mean, he, it's, <laughs> you know, when he does, after his shows, he'll usually go out to the merch table and sign autographs. And, you know, people are wanting my autograph, too. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't even do anything, really, except to strum a few chords with him. But I'll tell you, being around that and in that, it's it's intoxicating. It's it's a thing. You know, <laughs> I, I won't, I'm going to tell you, it's awesome kind of standing in that limelight a bit but you know that was something that happened then in the 60s you know and we did an album together actually as the four kind of my family safaris and we wrote eight songs together and i was able to contribute heavily co-produced on that all of us produced together and that was an awesome experience uh, to write kind of in this safari genre but actually record here in recent years but the term leaders is kind of a newer expression. I get to play with kind of my friends here locally that are, you know, my peers. And so that's a fun expression as well. But I can't say one's better than the other. They're just different tools for different jobs. One thing I have to ask you is how did you form the term leaders? The best word I could say to describe it is backwards. Usually, you know, some guys will get together in the garage kind of thing and kind of a garage band approach or the living room and strum tunes together and, you know, form a band. Most bands will, they'll kind of rehearse together and get a sound and then write, maybe write some songs or learn some covers and then go out and try and get a gig and play. This band, because of my reputation with the Safaris and being part of a, an established act, if you will, I was able to get the gig first just on my own merit. So I had I had a friend who owned a, the local establishment called Tio Leo's that we play and it was a it's a known place here in town for dancing especially in the swing dance thing in the 90s and early 2000s they that was kind of the hot dance club here in town for that kind of music and so I had contact Frank and said hey I'm interested in doing kind of a side project could I get like a Tuesday night or something just to kind of work out the bug I wanted a residency I just didn't want one gig I wanted to play consistently so I could put together something because again backwards I'd also recorded like all of Tourmaline Dream, I pretty much recorded that all by myself. Kind of like what Dave Grohl did when he, Nirvana finished up, you know, after Kurt Copain's passing. I was kind of like that. It's kind of like just me with a recorder, you know, it was when Pro Tools were, was coming out. I was able to kind of play all the parts myself. And I had a friend who played drums. His, his name, Leech Scarland. And I laid all the tracks down to a click track and then he played drums on it. So I already had a bunch of demos kind of up that eventually turned into Terminally and Dreams. So I had the gig and the album, and I just went to my friends and said, well, here's some demos. Listen to these and learn these songs. And they did. And they happen to be professionals. That's one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to really have a professional level band because if I was going to do something commercial with the Terminal Leaders, I wanted it to be as good as, not saying we are as good, but I was looking at bands like Low Straight Jackets. Have you ever seen them live? Oh, my God. Talk about a tight band. I was like, these guys are amazing. Or I saw Jackie and the Cedrics come from Japan once. They played here at the Casbah. My brother and I went and saw them. We were just floored how tight these guys were. And I was like, that's the kind of band I want to put together. It's just the, the Ventures were the same way. Lively ones. They were just super tight. So that's what I wanted to do with the turn leader. So we got together, practiced a couple of times. And over, well, we've been a band four years now. But last month will be our fourth year. We've slowly gotten better, you know, over time. And just kind of working it out in the minor leagues, 
here locally before we take it out. We like, we want to take it out next summer. We're hoping with this Pacific record signing that we could start touring and get out nationally and internationally eventually with the band. But everything's kind of come together backwards and, but now we're, we're doing pretty good. We've got 14 new songs that we're really excited for you guys to hear. The band, we've rehearsed these songs endlessly to get them just right. So what you hear is what you hear on the album and maybe a little better. How did you meet the other members of the band? Well, Joe, my second guitarist, he and I, we played together off and on. He has another band called the Bird Rock. They are out of Bird Rock, a little community here in San Diego Surf, real close to Wind and Sea Beach, which is a popular surf beach. Anyway, we've done a few things together, just jamming in the living room, played a couple little one-off shows here and there, but nothing serious. And then when I decided to do the Tourmalineers, my first call was a Joe. So we started rehearsing together. And then my friend Matt Bauman's who plays bass. I knew him uh, years ago. He's part of more of the downtown scene here, or funk, blues. In fact, he's from Memphis. He's born in Memphis. Okay. So he's, he's kind of got that soulful kind of thing. He's probably the best guitar player in the band, but he plays bass, <laughs> which is funny. He's such an incredible musician. He is really gifted. He knows music theory. He knows songwriting. He was in a band called Hot Chicken Stew that was, I think, out of Memphis or Nashville. And they were a touring act in the 90s. So I knew him and we'd connected. He said, yeah, if you ever do something, let me know. So I just kind of had a few people like that. We had another drummer originally that was a a friend of mine, Jake. And um, he was so busy with 10 other bands. You know, he's one of those kind of guys that played everybody in town. So he got a little too busy. So we filled in with John McAwee. John's a surfer. He and I connect really on a surfing level. He wasn't a surf drummer before this band, but he converted quickly. I threw him some ventures and low straight jackets and safari albums and said, learn these quick. <laughs> and he did. He was a quick study and he was in another band called Justin Fox Band. And they were out of Coast Mesa, Orange Grant, which is like an hour and a half north of here. And we had connected, but I always thought he was a cool guy and I loved his style. He had a real swingy kind of style. And then Ina came with Joe. <laughs> Our first show, it was just going to be me and Joe. And then Ina, her husband, Mauricio, and I surfed together. And he was like, dude, you got to hear Ina sing, man. And so we were doing this backyard party with a couple of acoustic guitars and old PA system. And Joe says, hey, you should have Ina come up and sing a couple tunes. I was like, all right. So she came up and sang, I don't know, we were doing Beatles covers or something. And she came up and sang, just blew us all away. We're like, wow, she's really good. I didn't even know she played keyboards, actually, at the time. And so we thought, well, if we're going to do surf song, you know, there's not really a surf scene here in San Diego where people come and just watch us, an instrumental surf band. Got to throw some vocals in there even to get booked. Even at Tio Leo's, they wanted us to. So we thought, okay, maybe we'll bring on a vocalist. But we found out she played keyboards. A lot of the songs on Tourmaline Dream that I recorded, I always put a little organ or Farfisa organ in the background to kind of fill out the sound. And so one day she brought a keyboard to rehearsal and we started teaching her parts and bam, found out, oh, she's a pretty good keyboard player too. So that's just kind of how it all came together. And we've been playing the same lineup except for drums, but John's been with us for almost two and a half, three years now. But yeah, just kind of came together backwards, but we're making it happen. Yeah, that's good. In the entire catalog of the Termaliners music is there a favorite that you have well of course the new album <laughs> <laughs> you have a favorite track um, from that one yeah i do there's one i mean, really the single's called grimace that's fun it's a it's a real ripper in fact i'm creating a music video for it right now it's gonna have a lot of surfing but there's a track on there that'll probably be our second single and i'll, I'll give you an exclusive here it's called swanky and it features uh eddie angel from low straight jackets is a friend of mine and he offered some of his playing on that as well and it's a really fun song kind of more in the link ray not so traditional sir more you know that kind of rumble uh jack the ripper kind of sound but it's very swanky <laughs> yeah. that's all i could say but yeah it's uh the termaliners featuring eddie angel of low street jackets on that one that'll be an awesome one to hear i'm sure we've got a couple other special guests you know i mean sharon yeah sure you know again with the safaris it kind of affords me to be in rooms and off situations where i get to meet some really cool other musicians and bands we play with and you know i, I build relationships with them and Many of them know that I'm, I'm doing the Termaliners now, and 
One of them was Bob Spalding from the touring, the ventures that are touring now. Yeah. Bob and I became friends and we played with the Suarez played with him a bunch of times. And when I came to this, he really liked Tourmaline Dream. He, in fact, he liked it so much. He told me that he may want to record some of those songs on future ventures albums as a songwriter. So I was really honored to have that. And so when we did this album, I said, well, hey, I got this song called Big Dipper. So he's on that. Um, we're looking forward to that. And then also the third one, which was kind of totally left field and, I'm also a big Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers fan, too. I didn't mention that, but nice, that's yeah. one of my top bands of all time. I've seen them a, him a number of times. But um, Mike Campbell is a surf guy, too. I mean, maybe more in the low straight jackets, ventures he kind of, if you want to call that surf, some don't, but <laughs> I do. He had a group called the Blue Stingrays, mm-hmm. and he did one album for Epitaph. It's just amazing. In fact, our new album, we kind of made the mix and the production to kind of sound like the Blue Stingrays album. When Tom was still alive, they recorded in 93, and, and I read this out of Tom's uh, biography, uh, one of his biographies someone wrote, and they said that Tom had taken some time off, and Mike had his own home studio, and he had met Low Straight Jackets. They were playing in town, and he took Tom to go see Low Straight Jackets. And after the show, they got to meet him. In fact, there's some pictures I've seen of them after that show. So Mike invited those great jackets to come over to his house and record in his home studio for free. Long story longer, those great jackets go over there, record a few songs. And so they build a relationship with Mike Campbell. Well, Mike Campbell comes out with this album later. He says, Oh, those great jackets, instead of Mike wasn't going to charge him any studio time. And they, I think the way Eddie tells it, they felt kind of bad about that. So they ended up buying. Mike Campbell, a vintage 1965 Moserite Ventures model guitar and gave it to him kind of as a thank you. So Mike took that guitar and recorded a full album of stuff called the Blue Stingrays under fake names. You know, he was kind of concerned that Tom Petty would get a little concerned about having them have their own album because he included some of the Heartbreakers as part of the album. Well, one of the people he included in that album by the Blue String Race uh, on bass was a guy named Ron Blair. Ron Blair played bass uh, on all that early stuff. For Particularly, he left the band for about 20 years and then came back for the last, I think, 17. But Ron, after Tom passed, he moved here to San Diego County to a town called Carlsbad, which is about 20 minutes north of where I live now. This gal uh, that I met at one of our shows name is Robin Peters. She's a local promoter, and she's actually now our agent. <laughs> but she knew Ron Blair. She represented him as well. And when we were doing this album, I said, what were, you, what were the chances of getting him to play? Because I knew he was part of the Blue Sting Rings. He played bass on the whole album. I said, he likes surf music, right? She's like, yeah, he's the Blue Sting Rings. And I said, well, you think he'd want to play a track? And so she asked him, and he said, yeah. So he contributed a bass line, all the bass on a song called Voyage to Mars. Such an amazing bass track. If you get it, turn up the bass in your stereo, because it's it's so epic. And it sounds like the Blue Stingray. So long story, but we're stoked to have those three special guests on the album. 